nanohub.org. You can follow along with this presentation using printed slides from the NanoHub. Visit www.nanohub.org and download the PDF file containing the slides for this presentation. Print them out and turn each page when you hear the following sound. Enjoy the show. All right. So now we're going to talk about full band structure effects in NEMA 1D. In the previous lecture, you saw that scattering wasn't quite doing the job of getting us closer to the valley current and to the turn on. And there was an indication that if you take a 10 band model or even a 2 band model, you get closer. So let me walk you through the physical effects of why that is. What that means is we have to go back way to the basics. Some things we talked in the previous lectures about, but sort of, sort of swept under the rug. So if you have isolated atoms, you know you have these discrete states, and you model them with s, p, and d orbitals. And that is how quantum mechanics really came into being. And we kind of said, well, you, as you move these atoms closer, and really closer, and you make a solid, then you start to form these bands. And these bands are where electrons can move, quote unquote, freely. And that is where we think of a solid and we work as engineers in transport and conductivity and mobility. And we assume that we really do device work and we're kind of far away from the physics that created these bands. I've shown this slide in the previous lecture, I'm going to show it again. If you look at a crystal, here's a quantum dot and it's rotating around, and on the top left you see how uh, there's two different views, and this crystal is certainly not symmetric in all crystal directions. Okay? The question really ought to be, why do you assume that there is no crystal dependence in your carrier transport. Why is there just a band that should be the same in all directions? Also, we know that you can describe the electronic structure on each of these atoms with s and p orbitals and d orbitals. These orbitals are nothing but symmetric. s orbitals are really symmetric, and the bonds are in crystal directions on asymmetric orbitals. Why do you assume that there's no crystal and orientation dependence on your carrier transport. And the question is really, what does it mean to propagate freely in a crystal? And again, as a reminder, for, for many of us as electrical engineers, we, we kind of know some of these things, but then in typical textbooks, somebody says, well, you know, we should solve this really complicated Schrodinger equation for this crystal. And we do an ansatz like this, where we assume plane waves, because everything is perfectly periodic in this little crystal. And we solve for the energy dispersion. And sort of kind of out of nowhere, this dispersion comes about. And this is in particular gallium arsenide dispersion, where there's a gamma point in the center, an X point on the top right, and some valence bands, and they look complicated. Boy, do they look complicated. So that, that is what we typically do. We say, well, they're too complicated for us. Because we're just lowly uh, semiconductor device engineers, right? So we're going to assume that these bands are parabolic. In the conduction band, also maybe at the X point, or down in the valence, valence band. And maybe we're being told, well, these bands are actually also coupled. There's a complex band structure in a complex plane for the decay. If you injected an electron in the middle of the gap, you would want to know what the attenuation constant is, right? Because we are injecting carriers in the middle of a gap of aluminum gallium arsenide that is buffered between gallium arsenide, because it's a barrier, right? The barrier is the stuff that's between the conduction band and the valence band. That's important. But we typically assume that these bands are decouple, and we place a parabolic band up in the conduction band, say, and we forget about all of these other bands, and we say, 
I, I have a conduction band, an effective mass, a mu, and after that, I just work in these concepts and I can build all kinds of complicated simulation tools in drift diffusion, in Boltzmann, even quantum transport simulations. Most quantum transport simulators that I'm aware of start from the base assumption of there's a conduction band edge and an M star. Everything else is parabolic. And the focal point of this presentation is, is how that breaks down. How that does not work for quantitative device engineering at resonant tunneling diodes at the nanometer scale. It breaks down because the bands are coupled. And there's material variations on the nanometer scale. So here's my introduction again to band structure engineering. What we can do indeed is in resonant tunneling diodes, for example, or in quantum wells, we can layer these blue and yellow atoms on top of each other, and these bands are going to misalign. And when they misalign, we just start to draw square band edge profiles. And we kind of start to forget that there's a Coulombic potential that is confining the electrons, that was creating those bands. And we just draw these bandage diagrams. And then we forget all about these Coulombic potentials and, and start to say, well, there's not even atoms. And in these square wells, we can do, again, very nice Schrodinger equation solutions, right? Because we can do particle in a box. And we start to compute ground state and excited states. And then we even just draw dashed lines to indicate what those states are. And then we say, we have artificial atoms on the nanometer scale. And we forget all of the stuff that was underneath. And we say, that's really cool. We can do photon absorption. We can do photon emission. We could do tunneling. And we can do this for real devices. Oops. Like detectors like lasers, like resonant tunneling diodes, and then we're really happy, right? We have a new world of materials in front of us. Right? We can design quantum devices. And we do this, generally speaking, in the model that's on the top, with stick diagrams, where there's a conduction band edge and an effective mass. That is, in general, how that is being taught. My point is, it fails. It fails to do quantitative device design. These concepts are really nice to explain a Mickey Mouse diagram of a device like that. But in order to do quantitative agreement, like on the bottom right, you have to introduce these atoms again. So you have to divide, resolve your device atomic layer by atomic layer which sounds expensive. It is. And then you put in these orbitals again, in these atomic cores, and you describe each of these atoms in the device with its appropriate orbitals, S, P, and D orbitals, that are talking to each other. The equivalent of that is to say, I have multiple bands that are in my device, that are all talking to each other. And Normally, we think of these stick diagrams as a device. I would like to offer another point of view. This is a new material that didn't exist anywhere else. It's a man-made new material with its new physical properties. So you have to think about using a more material approach to describing these new materials. In fact, you could also argue that at the nanometer scale, the difference between a new material and a new device is really vanishing. Okay? You can't distinguish, is it a new material or a new device? It's, it's new. As, as engineers, we want to make a device out of it, but as material scientists, you're like, cool, cool. This has completely new properties. Okay? So, for us, empirical diet binding has been the workhorse to really make this work, make work well. And I'm going to walk you through simple analysis of why these effects are important in the next few slides. 